Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 188. How to be the first person in your family with a PhD. This remarkable and really pretty unusual request comes from Gavin. Hi Gavin, amazing request this one. Gavin wanted me to talk through and help him manage what he described as the alienation, and that was his quote, the alienation from his family members. And he described the innate confidence of his peers who come from a family with fellow members who also hold a PhD. And he argued that if one is the first person in one's family to have a PhD uh, and to be enrolled in a PhD, that that simply adds another burden to an already difficult journey. Okay, now I'd never thought that this was a thing, but as always, you always surprise me and Gavin, I've tried to deliver a vlog in response to your request because why I think I was so amazed when this request arrived is I'd assumed everybody was the first person in their family to hold a PhD. But of course, as I started to talk to people about this fascinating request, the stories started to emerge about, oh no, no, Uncle Phil, he's got a PhD, his wife has a PhD, their kids have PhD. So these stories started to emerge. And of course, I went into the research literature and the statistics show that those with higher degrees marry those people with higher degrees. So they cluster. So once more, Gavin, you are ahead of the game. And wow, this was a, a weird and wonderful and fascinating topic to explore. So what I've done in the vlog this week, as I've inserted this request into our how-to series, and I want to talk about how this situation has emerged, how we've got a particular group that have a doctoral degree or are enrolled in a doctoral degree and none of their family have higher degrees. So I'm going to explore how that happened, but also how you manage anti-intellectualism and indeed the alienation from one's family. So really this is a vlog about how we get our family and our friends to be a part of our journey. But also it's a bit more than that, it's about how you keep your social world moving and your relationship strong going into a PhD and as you leave a PhD. And as Gavin knows, as many of you know, I've got a bit of skin in this game. My brother is Stephen Brabazon, Steve Brab, hi Steve Brab. Steve Brab and the Dean of your acquaintance were the first members of our family to go to university. And my brother Steve became a medical doctor, a fantastic medical doctor, contributed enormously to regional health in this country. He is a remarkable man. And I also went to university. Uh, and my father always thought that I would do law. You can see what's happening here. So the male of the family does medicine and the daughter does law, that's great. And of course I got into law very easily, not a problem. And I chose not to do law. I chose to do <laughs> a history degree and then honors and a whole series of different degrees and graduate diplomas. And then I did a research masters and a PhD. And I enrolled in that research masters when I was 22. I finished it when I was 23. I enrolled in the PhD at 23 and graduated when I was 25. So I was young and probably pretty naive woman at that point. But my father, who is a truly brilliant man, left school at 16, as most of his generation did. And when we always used to say to him, you're such a bright guy, Kev, you could have gone to university, there's not a doubt. He would always use that great line, yeah, but I preferred playing football than doing my homework. And I always loved that honesty to it. So bright guy, but just didn't do his homework, yeah. And my mother, a truly original thinker, but left school at 14 and had a life and career in retail. Okay, so I was a complete mystery to them. My brother Steve became a medical doctor. That's understandable. That's a, that's a good, solid job. But Kevin spent most of my undergraduate and postgraduate degrees wandering around the house with two mantras. She'll never work, you know. <laughs> She's a professional student. She'll never work, you know. And that was the characteristic of my undergraduate and postgraduate life. So Gavin, that's probably what you're talking about <laughs> in terms of isolation and anti-intellectualism. But can I say, I didn't read it like that at the time. 
I thought Kevin was, and indeed he was, expressing a legitimate fear. He was frightened that I would stay at university and I wouldn't get a job. I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. And can I say, that was also my legitimate fear as well. And the irony is, though, that I did stay in universities. I just got paid for it. And my first job, and we had a vlog on this, my first job was in Aotearoa, New Zealand at Wellington, and it was paid 40 thousand New Zealand dollars. Now that seemed an enormous amount of money and indeed it is. But I always remember Kevin's face when he said, well how much are you being paid to go to New Zealand? And I said, look forty thousand dollars for the year. And I always remember the look on his face because he finished his career as a foreman of a petrol company's terminal. You know those big terminals where the, the fuel comes in and off the docks and Kev was the foreman of that terminal and he finished work at 27 thousand dollars a year. Hard life, hard working life. And I think that was the moment. I was 24, I got a job and I left university to go and work in another and I've never been a day out of work since that time. But that of course has been fueled by my research masters and my PhD. So if I'd craved my father's blessing or his approval, I wouldn't have done a PhD and I would have been a guest star in my own life. My life would have been hollow and I would never have known what I could have become. But could I have handled that situation better with Kevin? Absolutely, absolutely I could. Now, okay, so much for me. What's going on here? Why do we have this gulf in experience and expertise between those who have entered university, entered degree programs and those who have not, and particularly the gulf between those who haven't gone to university and those in a doctoral program? So how do we understand that gulf and most importantly, what can we do about it? And I wanted to state right at the start that a PhD is an elite qualification and I'm not going to apologize for that. It must be elite. We must maintain standards and excellence. Yes, but just because it's an elite qualification doesn't mean we need to be elitist. That's different. Just because you have a PhD does not make you better or greater than any other human that walks this earth. If you breathe, you have rights. So the discussion today is not, why don't those people over there respect me for my brilliance because I'm doing a PhD. This is not like a Cartman moment from South Park, you know, respect my authority. We're, we're not doing that stuff. You have the gift and you have the privilege of completing a PhD. Therefore, there are responsibilities also required of you that you gift to the world. And that gifting starts with your family and your friends. Gavin, what you are experiencing, it may be anti-intellectualism, and of course we all know anti-intellectualism is terminal to citizenship, and the world really is in the mess it is right now, because so many of our fellow citizens don't read, don't write, don't think, don't communicate and speak to others with understanding. We confuse feeling with thinking, our experience with expertise. That's what's going wrong on the planet right now. But there is another way to respond to this anti-intellectualism, not with defiance or anger or brittleness, but with patience, with hard work and with compassion. We talked about in an earlier vlog the importance of all of us being organic intellectuals. That phrase comes from Antonio Gramsci. And Gramsci argued that an organic intellectual has so much expertise that they not only sort of know their field for their other researchers that work in that field, but they understand it so well that they can translate that research into a different vocabulary so all sorts of other groups can understand it. So that communication to diverse groups is really what an organic intellectual is. So if you like, anti-intellectualism is an opportunity for us to sharpen and strengthen what we know and find new strategies to communicate that knowledge. And that project does commence with our family and our friends. So let's start with our universities and ask that first great research question I always ask, and that is, what changed? 
what changed to create this gulf between members of a family in terms of education. And of course what changed in our universities to create that gulf between gown and town, university and community and doctoral program and society was the widening participation agenda. This is mostly linked with Tony Blair in the United Kingdom in the late 1990s where he had a project to try and ensure that half, that is 50% of 18 to 25 year olds are, have a chance of going to university or further training. And we had some of that in Australia a bit earlier with Hawke and Dawkins reforms. Okay, so that's the widening participation agenda. And the goal of it was to broaden out the people who have a chance to go to university. Now, politically, of course, it masked youth unemployment. It helped employers enormously because they didn't have to pay for training. People were arriving, workers were arriving, already pretty well trained because of a university degree. And politically, if you will, I believe it is incredibly important that the citizens who pay their taxes to make our extraordinary universities function, that they have a chance and opportunity to go to university. It's their taxes or their kids do. You know, I think it's a, an appalling situation that taxpayers pay to run a university when they have no chance or their kids have no chance of being a part of it. There's something really disturbing there. Okay, so we know that higher education is going through some traumas at the moment. It's going through some challenges and there's lots of causes of those difficulties and I, I read a lot in this area, I work in higher education studies and I've been amazed how many book titles that have been out in the last five years has the word crisis in it, crisis in our universities, universities in crisis, 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 crisis. And this literature which is now sort of generalised into what's called critical university studies has some problems. It romanticises the past of universities. You know, the present is terrible, neoliberalism, the present is terrible. And can I say their rendering of neoliberalism is often a bit well dodgy, so theoretically that's often a bit naive. But also, they're minimising the history of higher education. And let's be honest, it's a pretty dreadful history. Universities were, and are, colonial institutions so universities have moved around the world destroying indigenous languages, indigenous knowledges, indigenous structures, indigenous faith structures and imposing a particular often European or North American model of thinking about knowledge in and over indigenous peoples. Universities are also patriarchal, nay misogynist institutions devaluing women devaluing knowledge. Indeed, so many universities around the world did not allow women to even take out a degree through different parts and decades of the 20th century. Universities are also heteronormative. They're procreative. They normalise a man with a wife and children as the model of an academic. You know, the wife supporting her husband through his studies. That's the narrative. And that still exists, by the way. I'm doing some work on vice chancellors around the world at the moment and it is amazing when you read the profile of these vice chancellors and you know there's their qualifications and international excellence and you know their research and their teaching and that's fantastic but invariably there's a paragraph on their wife and their children. Now why do we need to know about a vice chancellor's wife and children? What's that got to do with his expertise to lead an organisation? nothing, but it demonstrates that heteronormativity. Also our universities are incredibly ableist to this day, to our great shame. We only enrol a minority of students with an impairment or a disability, very low numbers of enrolment. The issue gets even worse in our doctoral programs and even worse when we look at the numbers of academics with an impairment. Okay, so really let's not celebrate the good old days of sexism, homophobia, heteronormativity, uh, ableism, and let's not forget the, the nastiness of the colonial situation and the implication of universities in the colonization of indigenous peoples. So let's not pretty this up. So what the widening participation agenda captured was this desire to broaden out who is a part of higher education. So women, uh, crew with disabilities or impairments, Indigenous students, students of colour, 
the working class. So that's a good project. So more people were educated. Excellent. But in so many ways, the widening participation agenda capped the expectations of those groups. So this group, insert a particular disempowered group, has an undergraduate degree, so they've got a bachelor degree. Our business is now concluded. We can go, we've done good work, and they can leave the organisation. So higher degrees, the PhD, the research masters, were and still are in many ways preserved for the young, the male, the able-bodied and the white. And if you don't believe me, put into Google Images PhD student and look at the images that pop up. That's the narrative. So what this means is men and women who were the first in their family from these groups to make it to university were therefore the first in their family to then go on into a PhD program. So we do have a generational transformation in our universities. The next generation will be different, but this is the liminal moment of higher education. And that's why I was fascinated by Gavin's request. And I thought, let's have a go at doing what is quite a complicated vlog, I think. Yes, most people in a PhD program are the only people in their family with a PhD. Okay. But then also, as I said, I then did the study and it is remarkable how many people with PhDs marry each other. So both my husbands, wow, I sound like Liz Taylor. <laughs> both my husbands had, and of course have, uh, PhDs. And so I'm part of that PA, two PhD family and I make assumptions all the time about that and I understand what's going on. So as you can see, there is a clustering of qualifications in the elite, the white and the middle class. So let's now talk about the rest of us, okay? The people who made it through the widening participation agenda in the undergraduate program and somehow got themselves into a doctoral program. Congratulations, you are a legend. But what about your family and friends around you who weren't part of that widening participation agenda? How do you create a culture of support and care, but also disseminate the great gift of education? And the answer is what I call the TAC model, TAC, Transparency, Accountability and Communication, TAC. By the way, TAC is mine, so if you want to use it, knock yourself out. If you want people around you to be part of your journey, here is the strategy to enable that connection. Now certainly we live in anti-intellectual times, clever people are feared, they're attacked, they're abused, no doubt. Now we can be defensive, we can complain, or we can be inclusive and use the TAC model. So the way we create that culture of support and understanding is firstly through transparency. You need to explain with clarity what a PhD is why you're doing it. Express your motivations. As a starter, simply talk about the qualifications. So it is a degree. You have to produce an original contribution to knowledge. You have to do something over a longer period of time. In some systems, our system is three years, but other systems are different. You might be part-time, part you might be full-time. And explain the intensity of the process, but also why you love it why it's meaningful to you. Also, talk about what it's actually like to do a PhD. So do a day in the life of a PhD student. Talk about your discipline, your subject, the reading and the writing, your expectations of yourself, your supervisor's expectation, the institution's expectations of you. But talk about the why as well, why you're doing it. Why does the PhD matter to your life? and to your career, talk about employability. The PhD has the highest rate of employability of any degree you can do. And of course, many careers in health and education in particular, if you don't have a PhD, then your career trajectory is capped. So in a lot of health and educational areas, if you have a PhD, there is no limitation on how far you can go. So it's quite a valuable qualification. But also consultancies, small business development is based on your credibility, which a PhD gives you. Okay, so if people love and care for you, they will love and care for what you are interested in, what you believe in. So that's the first word. Let's go to accountability, okay? 
You need to explain, yes, with transparency, what is a PhD and why you're doing it, that's crucial, but something else is even more important, and that is accountability. If your partner, your kids, your friends, your parents are putting much of their life on hold so you can do the PhD, it obviously will create resentment, anger, bitterness. Now, it may be read as anti-intellectualism. I think it's more likely resentment because, and we've got to call this, the PhD is a selfish act, a very selfish act. The selfishness that we exhibit in a doctoral program, you just couldn't get away with <laughs> in the rest of your life. So this selfishness, if you're in a relationship with other people, and let's be honest, unless you're raised by wolves, all of us have relationships with other people, all of that has to be tempered with accountability. So explain with honesty how you will work this PhD. Talk about your timelines to completion. No excuses. None. No excuses. And great strategies that I've seen students use is they hold business meetings <laughs> once a week with their kids or their partner or their parents. So they have a business meeting once a week, often on Sunday morning, and they provide an update. So they explain what they have done this week. So there are accountability measures in place. So you're sharing the experience of a PhD, but further, you are also showing up where you are sacrificing and I am accountable to you for your sacrifice. This is what I've done this week. And that provides a space for your loved ones to be involved, but it does a bit more than that. It makes you, yeah, you, look in the mirror, stop the excuses, realize the privilege of doing a PhD, its impact on the people around you and the necessity to finish. Remember, you can enroll in a PhD. The important bit of that story is to finish a PhD. You've got to finish it. So with transparency and accountability, you will finish it. But there was a third letter there in that TAC model, and that is C, communication. PhDs are isolating and isolated. And we have conversations in our heads, don't we? We have conversations with ourselves. And particularly when we're tired, those conversations we have in our own head with ourselves are not hugely productive conversations. <laughs> so yes, communicate about your PhD. Talk about it. Share the experience. You've heard me say so often, it takes a family to finish a PhD. And let me say something to you. Every year we give the best PhD students a Vice Chancellor's Award. And can I tell you something remarkable? We give 12 a year. But the incredible thing is, the room is absolutely packed with family, friends, partners, kids. It's a wild, wonderful room. So 12 people bring basically a dialer crowd because it takes a family to finish a PhD. The path though to PhD disappointment if you don't communicate is that as we know, the PhDs are also littered with divorce, family estrangement, friendships are shattered. And the reason for that is the PhD students are lying to themselves and they're lying to others. They're making excuses. They're not holding themselves accountable for their decisions and they're transforming the PhD into their life rather than inserting the PhD into their life. You had a life before the PhD, you'll have a life after the PhD. The shape of your life after the PhD depends on how you communicate with others through the program. So yes, talk about it, share the experiences, the light and the shade, the people, the successes, the failures. And I know a lot of couples, often with kids too, who on Friday night or Saturday night watch these vlogs once a week. Now, I mean, I would find that truly horrifying. But the explanation for why, it's particularly the male students who sit with their wives and watch them, which is a very interesting combination, I think, is that it starts the conversation. It helps the partner, it helps the kids, understand what a PhD is and makes that process accountable and transparent. But the key is also to communicate with lots of different people. This is so important. Mix with multiple communities outside of your PhD. Go to the gym, go shopping, go for a walk, 
talk with people that you meet in daily life. Make every moment outside of your PhD precious. Experience that diversity of relationships. Talk with all sorts of people, not just university types. Because we can all blame those people over there for their ignorance, for their foolishness. We can all do that. But what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it to change the world? Do you just meet with your lab mates over a latte and complain that those people over there don't understand you? How arrogant is that? You've been given the gift, the gift of an education. Get out there, meet some people, talk to them. Most importantly, listen. You can learn a lot if you listen well. Remember, I have a maxim, if you breathe, you have rights. But I have another maxim, if you breathe, you have value. Transform your entire life into a lab, into a learning experience. Don't isolate yourself. Treat every conversation with every single person as a learning opportunity. Just because someone didn't have the chance to go to a university or enrol in a PhD doesn't mean that they have no value. They have great valuable value. They are very valuable. They have a view, they have an expertise, and you can listen and you can learn from it. So yes, we live in anti-intellectual times. Yes, our family members may have no understanding of what a PhD is. But what are you going to do about it? You can fester in that knowledge or you can listen, talk, learn. Use TAC. Transparency, accountability, communication. Now Karl Marx once said that life determines consciousness. Now that's a great phrase because what he meant is the life we live determines how we think about that life. So as we live that enables us, that's our frame to think about what's going on in our daily existence. So live that life, enjoy the diversity of views around you. The world is a wonderful place, people are extraordinary, so learn from them. Anti-intellectualism exists because we as intellectuals haven't worked hard enough to make the case about the value of our ideas. We've been brittle, we've been defensive, and we've been arrogant. We need to be welcoming, we need to be interested, and we need to be humble. The PhD is a gift. It's a privilege. It doesn't make us better or greater than anybody else. It provides us with an opportunity to organise conversations in the culture. The PhD is a pivot of our lives, our personal lives, our professional lives, our life as a citizen. But who you are on the other side of a PhD depends on you. Who is still with you? Your partners, your friends, your family members, whoever is on that other side of the PhD and still with you, that's in your hands to determine today. And that's based on transparency, accountability, and communication. Thanks, Gavin. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tia.